Welcome to Constructive Conversations, Building Canada's Stories. I'm your host, George Affleck. Join me as we dig into the foundations of Canada's construction industry, learning from leaders and pioneers in this business from the ground up. Today, I'm joined by Chris Gardner, the president of the Independent Contractors and Businesses Association, based in Burnaby, British Columbia. As the leader of the organization, Chris is extremely skilled and passionate about the construction industry and its workers. Let's start the conversation now. Hi, Chris. How's it going? It's great. Great to be here, George. Uh, thanks very much for taking time to do the interview today. Yeah, thanks for joining me. You know, this podcast series, uh, we've been working with you guys at the ICBA, uh, so we're really pleased to have you here to introduce, uh, you know, constructive conversations. Um, we want to continue this dialogue for your members and beyond, and I know you want to, but can you maybe talk about, you know, the impetus, the whole point of this, you know, constructive conversations and what you want to achieve with our conversations that we're having across this country? Well, you know, construction is what we say here at ICBA, one of the unsung heroes of our economy and our economic growth. And in British Columbia, approximately 250,000 men and women work in construction, contributing about 10% of the province's GDP. And But you don't often hear much about construction compared to other sectors of our economy, like high tech, uh, the clean energy sector. Those get a lot more attention um, than, than construction. And the reality is construction is happens in every single community across this province, across this country. Uh, it presents tremendous opportunities for young people pursuing a career in the trades, making career choices. Um, the opportunities in construction are significant. And one of the interesting things that, as we come out of the COVID-19 uh, global pandemic is that construction proved to be a very resilient career choice. It was deemed an essential service. So while other parts of our economy were, were tragically impacted in such a significant way. Uh, the men and women working in construction kept working. They were able to support themselves, their families, and their communities uh, because of the essential service designation. So not only challenging work, a resilient opportunity, great compensation, um, but there's, a, there's so much in construction that's exciting that doesn't get the attention that I think the sector and the men and women who work in it every day deserve. The, the ICBA itself, uh, as an organization, it does, it's quite diverse in its membership, too. And, and I'm wondering if you could tell us, for those maybe who are new to the ICBA, ICBA or haven't heard of the ICBA, maybe you could tell us a bit about the organization, uh, you know, and, and, and who you represent and, and why. Yeah, you know, ICBA, what we say is there's, ICBA is like a stool that has three legs, and they're all very, very important. Uh, one is, uh, the first one is we have over 3,000 members and clients that basically we provide services in three different areas for. Uh, the first is public policy advocacy. Everything related to ensuring that our uh, the construction part of our economy is dynamic, thriving, and growing, uh, we advocate for. Because a strong construction sector means a healthy and strong growing economy. Uh, second, group health and retirement benefits. Uh, there's nothing more important for, for anyone in any job than to ensure that they've got the benefits that are there when they and their or their family members need them. And so we've got uh, you know nearly 100,000 people on one of our benefit plans. Uh, it's big and it's growing. It has a, foot, a very strong footprint in British Columbia, but also in provinces uh, uh, outside of uh, British Columbia throughout Canada. That's a very exciting part of our business. And then the workforce development training side of our business, that third element that's vital important. ICBA itself trains nearly 5,000 construction professionals a year. Uh, we are the largest sponsor of trades apprentices in British Columbia. And, uh, you know, there's nothing more important right now across every sector of our economy than finding workers. Uh, the shortage of skilled workers in every part of our economy is acute. And that's because we have an aging workforce. And, um, and we don't have enough new younger workers going into uh, into in this case into construction. And so that's creating some pressures on the sector. So being able to train those individuals and provide opportunities for them to learn skills and advance their career is vitally important for every single construction contractor in British Columbia. I'm definitely in my conversations with uh, companies and organizations across the country as part of this series, I'm definitely hearing that that 
staffing and finding their team players, no matter where they are, any corner of this country, it's, they're having the same challenges. And a lot of these companies are, um, you know, family owned. Uh, they're they're they've been around some of them for ten years, some of them for fifty, sixty years. Um, and it's interesting. A lot of them have the same commitment to. Um, their their operations in that the staff are the highest that gives the highest priority you know to retaining staff to to respecting staff to giving them all the things like training and benefits and and just being really part of the we're seeing hearing a lot hearing a lot about connecting with the communities across this country and how they they really do get involved and and I think a lot of it has to do with just keeping their staff and keeping the great ones no matter what's happening with the economy even the ups and downs. I'm hearing a lot of a lot of commitment to to their staff. Um, and do, do, is that something that th- those benefits that you talk about, those things that you those planks, those stool legs that uh, you talk about, are, are key to assisting them in in, in prioritizing uh, that at this you know their staff as a as a as a thing. Definitely. Listen, in the in 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 this right now, as we come out of the COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, and the economy starts to uh, to advance and to grow again. Um, construction, as I said earlier, uh, was deemed an essential service. So construction workers, for the most part, um, kept working during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But construction wasn't immune from the impacts of, of COVID-19. Uh, we estimate that in British Columbia in 2020, about 15% of the construction activity uh, was taken out of the market because of, uh, because of the pandemic. Um, and we expect, you know, that recovery to be a little uneven. Uh, different parts of the province uh, this year will do better than others. And then in 2022, uh, we expect to uh, be back into uh, a situation where the construction sector is going to be growing again in a fairly significant way. So through all of this, um, the biggest challenge is recruiting workers and retaining workers. And if you're going to retain and attract and retain workers, you're going to need to ensure that they have obviously uh, opportunities for for challenging work, opportunities for career advancement, uh, strong a strong and healthy benefit plan for both themselves and the members of their family. Um, because uh, you know, one, if you look at Canada, the demographic uh, profile of Canada, if you took out immigration, Canada's population would be uh, flat or declining. And so as we, ha- we have an aging workforce, and there's really only two ways to address that, not only in construction, but in all parts of our economy, and that's to become more productive uh, or through immigration. And it's those two levers uh, that are vitally important to ensure that Canada's economy continues to grow, to prosper, to provide opportunities and jobs for Canadians across, across the country. And so for the construction sector, uh, facing... Uh, and, in, and certainly in British Columbia, a very strong construction market. It's been very strong for a number of years. If you're going to recruit and retain a skilled workforce, you've got to pay attention to all of those elements that make a healthy and dynamic workplace. And that's training, uh, opportunities to, for advancement um, and, and benefits, uh, and then opportunities to work on exciting projects. And there's a lot of them going on in British Columbia. That you know the the training well certainly the benefits and I think a lot of people might be surprised at all the things that these a lot of you know private companies across the country who are providing many many positive benefits uh, like benefits themselves as far as insurance uh, and the training as well and, and and a lot of that also protects the workers from injuries I and mean, are you seeing uh, that as a real positive and a real uh, impact on you know when the, with the proper training that injuries uh, cases do go down. Yeah, there's there's no question about that, and and there's what, what's interesting about construction is that it is a high risk uh, occupation. Uh, lots of uh, lots of uh, opportunities when you're working on a construction site for injuries to occur. So safety is is hardwired into the DNA of construction contractors and of every uh, man and woman who works in construction. They wake up, the, they start off their day with to, a toolbox talk at the beginning of every shift, and and a toolbox talk. You are basically saying, uh, okay, here's what's going to happen on the site today. Be aware of this. Be aware of that. Uh, we're going to be craning over here. We're going to be moving equipment in this part of the site. So everyone is, is aware of what's going on on the site. And then there's, 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 uh, there's a part of the toolbox talk that addresses something that's topical. So, for example, um, you know, ensuring that you're, uh, 
you're using fall protection if you're working at heights, or um, you know you're, you're you're using all the safe work procedures for everything you're going to be doing that day. All of that is critically important, and underpinning that is that that commitment to safety, that culture of safety, is uh, a robust and healthy uh, group health plan, so that. Um, so that not only if something happens, obviously on the work site, but just your regular day to day, month to month, year to year, annual checkups, going to the dentist, all of those things that are important to maintain uh, to maintain your health, a healthy lifestyle for both you and, and your members of your family. And when you talk about growth and, and the fact that, that we see uh, continue, you know, Canada is growing because of the immigration policies that we have, but also you look at the each, especially in British Columbia, where we're seeing well, for as long as I can remember, we've had the same percentage of growth per year, you know, you know, roughly the same per every year, same number of people moving to the province. And, uh, you know, that that you have to plan for the future and have the ability to have the work people that can do the, the work that needs to get done to, to build a growing economy and growing uh, market. So that's important that people are safe and healthy and uh, protected. Yeah. And, and, you know, another aspect of, of health is, is wellness and uh, wellness, you know, mental wellness. And that's something that was uh, emerging as a really important issue in all parts of, of our society before the COVID-19 pandemic. And coming through uh, the pandemic, you know, isolation, uh, all of the uh, safety protocols that were put in place to prevent the spread of the virus exacerbated um the incidence of challenges with with mental health, and so one of the things we're launching at ICBA over the coming weeks is is a is a very innovative uh, workplace wellness program that's going to provide supports and an opportunity to talk about the challenges that all of us face in our daily lives to ensure that you know there's there's opportunities for workers to say yeah you know th- you know I do kind of you know get down every now and then or experiencing these kinds of of challenges, not you know, can, you know, can I, is there someone I can talk to? And we want to provide that opportunity for those very, very important discussions, um, because it's it's a it's an area that has for far too long been lurking under the surface. It's, it, it runs silent uh, and it runs deep, uh, but the the impact of it on individuals and families is uh, can be uh, very, very damaging. And so we've got to shine a light on it. And do it in a way that's positive, that people feel supported and encouraged, and and have the uh, and 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 don't aren't afraid to come forward and say, "Hey, I need some help." One of the to pivot a little bit, uh, you know, some of the work you've done with the industry right from the start, in fact, has been because of the politics of construction. Can you explain a bit more about that and how, you know, who's in charge and can have an impact of the work that's available? Yeah, you know, one of the things that there's there's um, there are some challenges. Uh, you know, we've talked about the opportunities in construction. There's some challenges that uh, the sector is facing, and and it operates on a number of different levels. And and if you think of, uh, you know, we talked earlier about productivity and being more productive as uh, as a country and being more competitive. And uh, every year, the uh, the the World Bank puts out a study called Doing Business, and it ranks countries on a number of different metrics. And one of those metrics is the length of time it takes uh, to uh, to get a construction permit issued on a project. And on that scale, Canada ranks number sixty four. Uh, we're a G seven economy, but in the time it takes to have a construction permit issued, uh, we rank number sixty four. And and it is um, it's it's an embarrassing statistic. Uh, for Canada, and it goes to a lot of the red tape and regulations that uh, prevent us from from bringing projects online faster, and and that it's and faster, but not in a way to no one's talking about faster, meaning that we compromise issues related to safety or the environment. Uh, faster means we've got to be more effective at identifying opportunities uh, where investors are looking for places to. Uh, uh, and economies to invest in, and they know that there's a, a certainty of process, and that that timeline isn't going to be onerous. The requirements aren't going to be onerous. They can be thorough uh, and robust, uh, 
Um, but when we rank number 64 in the world in terms of the time it takes to uh, issue a construction permit, and then you think about the affordability crisis we have in housing in many major centers in British Columbia, and the fact, and you know this well, George, given your time as a councillor in the city of Vancouver, it now takes as long or longer to get a, a, a project approved as it does to build it. And so when you combine that that difficult the difficulty in bringing projects online with the fees and taxes that are layered onto projects, um, it does impact affordability. And so, you know, affordability for the first time home buyer, the first time home buyer and affordability meet at City Hall, and it doesn't end very well for first time home buyers uh, because of the length of time it takes to get supply onto the market and the taxes and the fees that flow right through. Uh, to the uh, the families that are purchasing those homes. So that's one element of the challenge that that we face in in British Columbia and in Canada. And another element, and and it's the common theme in all of this is that government policies that may be well intentioned, but they end up distorting the market and uh, increasing costs and or preventing opportunities. So a great example of that in British Columbia is 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 community benefit agreements. And you know the purpose of community benefit agreements. Um, which everyone supports is 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 the uh, the thrust to hire more women, more young people, more people from indigenous communities, uh, to ensure that um, there are opportunities in construction that are are present uh, that are given to groups that traditionally haven't haven't had those opportunities uh, in construction and may not have been aware of them, um, and or considered them as as an opportunity for for a career choice. Uh, so that those nobody would object to that. The challenge with the community benefit agreements. As, they being, as they're being rolled out in British Columbia, is that uh, what the government is effectively saying is if you're going to work on projects de- designated under a community benefit agreement in British Columbia, uh, you have to be a member of a building trades union. And the challenge with that in British Columbia, only 12% of the 250,000 men and women who work in construction in this province are members of a building trade union. So when the government says you have to be a member of a building trades union to work on a project, they're basically saying only 12% of the workforce is able to work on that project. Uh, so that's unfair. Uh, it's discriminatory. And so our position would be, listen, every construction contractor in this province should have a fair shot uh, at the work. There should be no special deals, no special favors. Uh, come one, come all. And the best bid, um, the best proposal uh, should be selected, and that will ensure that that the process is fair, and that taxpayers are uh, are getting full value for their money. And so, um, it is. Um, and and to enact CBAs, the government's created a new crown corporation, um, and so they they spent a lot of money setting up, you know, a bureaucracy to manage and report out on the progress of CBAs. And so, what have we seen? The cost of projects that are built under CBAs versus those that aren't. Have uh, have increased by 25, 30, 35, up to 40 percent, and so uh, everybody loses. Fewer opportunities for workers, uh, and taxpayers are paying more. They're getting less, uh, so it doesn't make sense. And so one of the things that we talk about a lot in in our society is smart smart government. Or sorry, we talk about smartphones, smart homes, smart everything. We're not talking about smart government. And so if we're going to be more competitive, if we're going to build a, a, an economy that's, that's cleaner and greener and that's going to provide long-term prosperity, we need smart government policies. We need to take the politics and the ideology out of so many of these decisions, which are layering on costs, making our economy less competitive, preventing opportunities for people to fully participate in the economy, and, uh, and driving taxes up for taxpayers. There's an irony that uh, the goals of the government, whether it be provincial, federal, local, um, <clears throat> is to achieve these goals is you know is housing and 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 get there creating these bottlenecks themselves by reducing them the people who can apply to do the work and so you create this bottleneck in se- sectors and and you look at uh, certain communities where their uh, councillors are very political and they're putting in motions that are layering on policy on top of policy on top of policy which of course staff get confused by developers and builders and even you know persons who want to renovate their bathroom are so lost and mired in the complexities of approval that everything just gets pushed and bound it's, it's very frustrating so and for you as an organization to navigate that's so complex how do you actually navigate three layers of government and multiple you know especially when you think about municipal governments when there are so many of them each of them with their own strategy and and policies and i mean how do you as an organization really find a way to get through all that 
Well, the local level is the most difficult because of, there's so many uh, different uh, municipalities, cities, towns in the province. And so, um, you know, Vancouver's the, the largest city. It's in, the, it's in the, 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 the biggest media market. It gets the most attention. But it is very difficult and challenging for organizations like ours to, to lobby you know, hundreds of different uh, uh, local governments. Uh, easier when you're talking to Victoria in the sense that there's, you go, it's one city, you have a, uh, the premier and the cabinet, and it, so it's an it's, it's a easier level of government to, to, to lobby for change for government policy, and then federally is the same. The challenge with our federal, the, the lobbying federally in, in Canada is that the further you are away from the center of Canada, the more challenging it becomes to get on the radar screen uh, of, of government officials uh, when so much of what happens in the country really revolves around Ontario and Quebec. Uh, so Victoria is where we spend uh, a, a fair bit of our time um, in terms of uh, making submissions uh, to uh, provincial ministers, um, looking at opportunities to um, to improve government policies as it relates to everything from taxation, regulation, WorkSafe BC, uh, labor code issues, project approvals on infrastructure projects, um, the spending that comes out of, uh, for example, the Ministry of Transportation, which has a big budget that funds a, a lot of uh, local and regional and provincial projects. So there's a lot of there's a lot of attention we spend there. But when it comes to issues like housing permit approvals, um, the inspection process um, that happens locally when a project is being built, it it is challenging um, to uh, you know we tend to be a little bit more reactive than proactive um, because there's just so many municipalities in, in the province. Sorry, it's good. fire engine going by there. Um, the industry, you know, you, you touched on this uh, on, re related to the pandemic that we've been all living through. Um, how do you see the recovery then over the next, you know, few months and, and years for, you know, while the while the industry was not as hard hit perhaps as some other industries, uh, everything kind of connects together. And how do you see the next months and years ahead for the the sector uh, specifically for the ICBA? Yeah, you know, one of the interesting things about um, the pandemic from in terms of the construction sector is that one of the things that uh, is hardwired into the DNA of construction workers, as I said earlier, is safety. And and construction projects are linear. You know, you start the, you, there's a there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so one of the things that construction contractors are very good at are mobilizing uh, people and equipment. And, and maintaining a schedule to get a project uh, to completion. And so when the new safety protocols were rolled out for uh, how to operate safely in a COVID-19 pandemic, um, construction responded uh, quickly and, and, and uh, adopted those protocols. And uh, up until the end of last year, uh, there was only one case that of, uh, uh, of COVID-19 being uh, transmitted on a construction site um, that was recognized by WorkSafe BC. So it was a, it was an outstanding record of of safety and a commitment to to working safely by construction contractors and their employees. So as we go forward, um, as we come out of the pandemic, um, you know, construction uh, fared better than most. It was deemed uh, an essential service. And for the most part, construction workers kept working. There weren't a lot of projects that were outright canceled. There were some delays in RFPs coming out. Definitely timelines on existing projects were, were impacted because of the new safety protocols. Um, so we, you know, we, we estimate that in 2020, uh, activity declined by 15%. We think this year is going to be flat in terms of, uh, so similar in terms of activity to uh, to last year, but we are noticing now that as people look forward and the prospect of, of widespread adoption of uh, vaccinations is on the horizon, as you look at Q3, Q4 of this year, maybe a return to more normal, certainly normal activity in Q4, um, in some sectors of the construction market, high-rise residential for one, it could snap back faster than we might anticipate. And, and large parts of our economy, the travel sector, hotels, tourism, could also experience that uh, that very rapid recovery at the end of this year. So going into 2022, we think we'll be returning to uh, uh, to a fairly strong 
uh, growth scenario for the uh, construction sector in this province. My uh, my son, one of my kids, and he's nineteen. Is a he's uh, my, I have two sons and a daughter, and he's nineteen. He's in. He's got a band, and. Uh, so that's great. And he's very talented. But he's also, what's interesting, he's considering, uh, you know, his backup plan. It's not university. Uh, is, you know, the, the, when I was, when I graduated from high school, all parents were driving, getting us, go to university, go to university. There's a, he and most of his friends, and they all graduated, they're all, you know, smart kids. They're all really, it seems to be interested in the trades uh, as, as a way, as an opportunity. And I'm wondering for you, you know, saying to younger people considering a career in construction, or to those actually... Because what I what he's interested in is a sort of an entrepreneurial side of it as well. This opportunity to that it, the industry is quite entrepreneurial, uh, and so not only is there the opportunity just to, for the work uh, once you're trained, uh, but there's the opportunity to move into the as an entrepreneur and grow your own small business or even grow it into a bigger business. A lot of the companies I'm talking to started small, and they they've expanded into these massive organizations. I mean, so what would you say to younger people right now considering that those things? Well, you, hit, you know, this is really one of the untold stories of construction is the entrepreneurial opportunities from learning a skill, learning a trade, getting some experience, and then starting your own business. And that is the story of every construction company in this province. Um, they all started with, uh, with an idea, with someone who said, hey, I'm going to start my own company, whether that's a mechanical contractor, a plumbing contractor, someone who does drywall, uh, someone who does metal fabrication. These are all entrepreneurs at heart. And we don't tell that story enough in uh, in high school when, when kids are starting to make decisions about um, the career choices that they're going to make. I remember when I was in high school, uh, to the point that you just made, it was, you know, go to university, arts and sciences, you know, you're in this stream. And if you're not smart enough, quote unquote, uh, for that stream, we'll just go down the hallway, turn left, and there's, there's, that's where the shops are. And you can go there and, 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 and work there and, fi- and figure something out. You're sort of left to your own devices. Um, the reality is uh, learning a trade and a career in the trades and starting your own business, very exciting, uh, tremendous opportunities. The co- because there is a shortage of construction workers, compensation is... Uh, is, is excellent in uh, the compensation packages and the benefits to construct offered to construction workers. Uh, the exciting projects you get to work on, you, know, you drive around the lower mainland, other parts of British Columbia, and you see um, you know, exciting high-rise complexes that are going up, new convention centers, community centers, bridges, roads. Uh, people build those, uh, and they're exciting to see how it starts from effectively nothing to the finished product. A lot to be proud of for the men and women who, who have those skills to be able to turn those projects from, you know, drawings on a piece of paper to physical structures that change people's lives, improve their lives, make them easier, uh, and and create monuments uh, that are, in, in many cases, stunning. Uh, so a career in the, in the trades is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, and once you have those skills... Uh, you can work in any province in this country. You can work. Uh, you can work in any country you want uh, if you decide to to take those skills to a different jurisdiction. Uh, and start. What can be more exciting about starting your own business and hiring people and providing opportunities for them to realize their dreams? So um, I don't think there's a there's a there's a career that's uh, more exciting than uh, than uh, than construction. And on that note, Chris, I'm going to say thanks very much for uh, taking time today to chat with me. Uh, and I look forward to uh, further conversations uh, uh, in the industry in the future. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. It was great to be here. I'm George Affleck. Thanks for joining me at Constructive Conversations, Building Canada Stories, where we dig into the foundations of Canada's construction industry, learning from leaders and pioneers in the business.